And we're live. All right, so hopefully we'll have some people joining us in a minute. Hey, awesome. I've got people um, registering. Hi, Kim. Thanks for joining us. Huffington Post blogger from Paris, currently in Texas. Hi, Sajoni. I hope I've pronounced your name correctly. Hi, Alex. Thanks for joining us from Texas. We're just going to... Uh, have a couple of minutes to let people come and register and uh, just say hey, jump on out, chat in the chat box, type a message, where are you from, so we can say hey, bonjour. It's so great to have people from around the world. Oh, not someone else from France, Leah in Australia. I hope you're enjoying Down Under, Lee. Hello from Sydney, Sabina. Charleston, Edie. Love Charleston. Thanks for joining us. Yes, Jody. Um, for this webinar, um, you can all chat in the chat box and type your messages and stuff. Um, but uh, as for speaking, that that won't be a function at the moment. Isabel from Germany in Australia. Oh, so great, all these um, people visiting Australia from around the world. Hi, Melanie from Vancouver and Cliff. Yay! Let's go the Aussie Mail in here. Well done. Thanks for joining, Cliff. Gail from Utah. Such a beautiful state, Gail. Thanks for joining us. Natasha from Toronto representing the uh, entire world at the moment, I think. We need someone from Europe, although I think it might be the middle of the night in Europe. We'll just give it a couple more minutes and then we will get started. So don't forget to jump out and say g'day. Tell us where you're uh, coming from today. Yeah, lots of Aussies here and I hope um, up here on the Gold Coast we've got another gorgeous day. So I hope, um, well, wherever you are in the world, the sun's shining. From Bogota, Colombia. Hi, Sabina. Awesome. We've got uh, someone now from South America. All right, I think uh, we might get started. So, and I'm sure there will probably be people joining us um, as we start, but uh, we'll kick this off so we've got enough time to chat 
all about India. So let's go. So thanks for joining us on our webinar on how to travel safely to India as a solo female traveller or for the males as well, a solo travel, whatever we talk about today is going to apply. And of course, and we want you to love it as well. So first of all, I just want to take a moment to thank you um, for showing up today. It's not easy to go after the life you want and you know, many times it feels like there are a lot of obstacles against us, whether it be time or money um, or opportunities and underneath that is present usually uh, some sort of fear. So showing up and committing to your dreams and searching, searching for solutions to your fears is the key to um, achieving your dreams. So, uh, you know, thank yourself today for honouring your dreams and, and for, for making the journey halfway by showing up. And I just wanted to give you a little thanks as well for showing up today and helping me to realise one of my own dreams, which was to connect with my community more through webinars. So this has really um, pushed me to do it. So thank you for that. Um, I just want to uh, just remind you that presence is the key to all change and learning. So you've made the time to come here today for a reason. So do be sure that you turn off your cell phone and shut down all your other tabs and browsers. Um, not only that can they distract you, but they can slow down your bandwidth. And uh, shut the door, eliminate outside distractions, grab yourself a cuppa, or depending where you are in the world, it might be a glass of wine, probably not if you're in Australia, but hey, we're not going to judge. And just enjoy everything that you're about to learn. So, you know, this webinar could change your life. But having said that, we do have a hashtag for this webinar, so feel free to use that if you do want to send out a tweet, either uh, through the webinar now or after, and that's We Go Solo India and then our um, usernames are down the bottom there. We've got something really exciting as a thank you for sticking with us until the end and I'll show you how to access that at the end of the webinar. So we're going to give you a simple cheat sheet with tips for travelling safely to India as a woman. Um, Mary Ellen has also generously given a copy of her book Song of India, her e-book, which you'll get access to. And Rena has offered a free 45-minute clarity and planning session for those travelling to India, and that's available for the first 25 people. And we also have another essential travel checklist. So stick to the end and you'll learn how to uh, get access to that. So here are our, your hosts. There's obviously myself, Kaz from whytravelblog.com, Rena Tori from uh, mantrawild.com.au, and Mary Ellen from breathedreamgrow.com. So your three hosts and one of them has no idea about travel in India, which is me. But I do have an idea about solo travel. I first left to go travelling in 1997 and I went as a solo travel traveller. But my first trip was to Indonesia with two girlfriends. And many said that we were crazy, but we went anyway despite being a little bit of afraid and we had the best adventures ever. Now, it did involve being kidnapped on a motorbike by some crazy locals, but so I do understand fear and I learned very quickly um, ways to take better safety precautions. Now, so thankfully nothing happened and I do have a great story now to share. Um, you'll see there my husband Craig is the co-founder of Why Travel Blog as well and we married in 02 and we've been living and travelling around the world together since then. So we started our travel blog in 2010 with the mission to help people travel more. Why? Because we believe it gives you enriching memories so that you can look back on your life and say that you've lived it well. We also wanted to help people to understand that the world is mostly full of kind and loving people and the more that you travel and experience that, the more you advocate for peace and kindness in your own life. And as Gandhi said, which I'm so great, I'm so grateful I can share his comment in this particular webinar, is be the change you wish to see in the world. And that's um, probably one of my most important life mottos that I um, live by. And so creating the blog was, uh, that was part of the mission in creating our blog behind that. And now we have two beautiful girls, Kalira and Savannah, who've been travelling with us since birth. And we just completed an 18-month road trip around Australia. So again, we had many fears and we had many people telling us why we couldn't and we shouldn't do it. But I don't believe we should be living our life for others. Only you know what your heart calls you to do. And what I've learned through 17 years of travel 
and running my own successful business is that when you follow your heart and overcome those fears, the world will open up many amazing opportunities for you and you'll be way more supported than you realise. So I truly believe if you put out a lot of love, you'll get it back and I think our two guests today um, will share with you more of that belief. So how did this webinar came about? Well, a few weeks ago, Craig and I, we put a update on our Facebook page sharing about the Taj Mahal and there was quite a discussion following it about travel safety in India, mostly from women speaking about their fears of being attacked. And if you can see in my comment, which I have a red arrow going to, I had nothing to contribute and I said that I know nothing about this and they were talking about acid attacks in, in Delhi. Now I don't any, know anything about this because I rarely pay attention to the media. So I'd, I'd heard of the gang rape in Delhi before but I didn't think too much about it. Obviously I have had a bit of compassion there because I, I just didn't feel it was a travel related incident. It feels like it's something that happens to women all over the world. We have the same threat in our own backyard but that doesn't stop us from going out and, and living our life. So I do have reservations to travelling to India though and I haven't been there because of my uh, trepidation about the crowds and the constant harassment and poverty because these are the only stories I've heard in the negative form from travellers who have been to India. So after this update, Mary Ellen contacted me offering to write a guest post on our site dispelling the myths and I suggested we do this webinar instead and invited Rena to join us. So I'm intrigued about travel to India as I know that you all are here who are joining us and I hate knowing that people won't follow their dreams because they might feel too afraid or are ill informed. So our two guests today, uh, Rena and Mary, Mary Ellen, are here to offer their expert advice and um, make you feel more comfortable. So just a quick survey I had some of you fill out. Um, so as you can see, this is about your concerns about travel in India as a solo female and of course the majority there are saying they're most concerned about unwanted attention by males, closely followed by violent crime against women and then the crowds, the constant attention and the poverty um, come last. So I just want to um, let you know that Rena and Mary Ellen here are, are chatting with us today not as experts on statistics and um, social cultural uh, factors etc but sharing their personal experiences through travelling in India. So they're not here to tell you that there are no dangers um, travelling in India just as there are dangers in every country we travel to but to empower you to practice safe travel practices and perhaps to look beyond the media hype and to maybe see uh, what India can offer you as a destination. So we're here today to help eliminate your fears so you can embrace your calling to travel to India. I'm guessing that you have a strong calling to travel to India. Most people who go there uh, love it and feel, feel that they were called to visit there. So I believe that you must follow your calling no matter the intensity of your fear. So with that, let's just um, introduce you to the ladies who are going to help us today. Rena Tori, she's a passionate soul-seeking traveller, conservationist and the founder of Mantra Wild Adventures which is a boutique travel company specialising in personally crafted private journeys that peel back the layers of India. Now her company's motto is to travel on purpose and Rena's aim is for her clients to have an India experience that changes their lives forever. Mary Ellen Ward is a professional travel writer and cultural explorer. She's based in Toronto but sometimes lives in Delhi. Her award winning travel blog breathedreamgo.com is about meaningful adventure travel and it is inspired by her adventures and travels in India. She does write for many print and online sites. She co-founded the Toronto Travel Massive and founded the We Go Solo online community for female solo travellers. And that of course inspired us for our hashtag We Go Solo India. And Mary Ellen considers India to be her soul culture, which is a, an expression I absolutely love and I'm sure that we can all connect to that idea that somewhere in the world there is a soul culture for us that's not necessarily the culture of our birth. So with that, I'm going to um, pass over to the ladies and we're going to get straight into 
our chat about travel in India. So welcome, ladies. Thank you so much for joining us. And I think we might dive straight in. And I'd love for you to start telling, um, tell us a little bit about yourself and what makes you such devout travel fans um, and advocate, sorry, devout fans of India and advocates for travel in India. So Mary Ellen, I've got you on camera. Would you like to jump in there? Sure. Thank you very much for having uh, uh, me and Rena on this webinar. I think it's great to kind of dispel some of the misinformation out there and empower people. I completely agree with your message. Uh, we're definitely on the same page um, and very, very happy to share my experiences in the webinar on my blog and just basically wherever I get a chance um, to also help empower women to overcome their fears. Um, and in fact that's exactly what I did. I mean my blog is called Breathe Dream Go and it, the name is actually a mantra. Breathe, dream and go. And it's actually what happened in my life. Uh, to make a long story short, I was actually in quite a very deep depression following um, several losses in my life including the loss of, sudden loss of my mother which um, you know had a really uh, strong impact on me, a lot of grief and um, it was one of the things that inspired me originally to travel to India as well as I'm a long time yoga student and um, a whole bunch of other factors too but I originally traveled to India in 2005 and I was racked with anxiety and nervousness before I went um, I had never done a big trip before. I wasn't an experienced backpacker or solo traveler, I can assure you. I was just kind of an average person, you know, with my job in Toronto. And, but I really, really felt I needed to do something big to shake up my life. I needed to have an adventure. I needed to, you know, it's like um, that saying about throwing yourself off the, off the cliff. I really needed to do that. And um, so, so, you know, I decided for me, uh, I, felt I, was one of the, I am one of those people who felt very called to go to India, even in spite of all my apprehensions and fears. And it took me a year, almost a year, 11 months of saving and planning. And then I, I jumped, off the, jumped off the cliff on December 5th, uh, 2005. And I went to India knowing almost, basically sort of knowing one person in the country. Um, mm -hmm. I had a ticket dated for six, I was supposed to be there for six months. I had a ticket, I left in December. My return ticket was dated June 2nd. I had no idea what was going to happen to me in those six months. Suspected wow. it might be, suspected it might be, you know, like a very long, dark night of the soul. Suspected it might be awful. Um, I'd heard all those, you know, horror stories about travel in India, Delhi belly and the crowds yeah. and the chaos. But I do have to say, back then, um, this issue of India being particularly unsafe for women was not. It, it didn't have the media, it wasn't under the media spotlight that it is today for whatever reason. It was not one of my concerns. Mm. Um, I, I, I never came across that. I came across that there was, you know, lots of travel challenges um, and that, uh, you know, that India really forced you to look at yourself. And, uh, but this idea of India being unsafe for women particularly, no, it wasn't one of my fears then. Um, still isn't actually. Um, and, uh, so that was it. So I went, that was my first trip. I've been back six times since then. So I guess wow. you can figure. I guess you can figure out that that trip actually turned out really well. I actually call yeah. it. I call it a magic carpet ride now. Yeah. So it, it was a great trip. It was a. It was, you know, it was the cliche. It was a life changing, totally and utterly life changing trip, and um, it's just had so many wonderful, beneficial aspects on my life. I could probably talk about that all evening, but I won't. <laughs> That's great. It's great to get an insight and to see how you were feeling um, before you went traveling, yeah, but went definitely. anyway, and then yeah. where that led. Yeah, fantastic. Which is so important for people to realize that the fear is there for everybody, but yeah. there are ways to manage and control it. So let's jump over to Rena. If you'd want to tell us a little bit about yourself, Rena, and what, what called you to India and why you love it so much. Sure. Thanks, Caroline, and thank you so much for putting on this awesome webinar. It's great to be on with Mary Ellen as well. Uh, for me, I, I am of Indian background, so I did grow up with the Indian culture, but from a young age, I really rejected my culture. Um, I didn't like the traditional stereotype roles of, you know, women in the kitchen and the men, you know, sitting outside. And I was, because I came from a single parent family, um, I really kind of rejected that side of it and you know it's not something that's specific to Indian culture as well it's a societal thing um, and then as 
growing up, um, that rejection continued. But in 2002, I took a trip to Canada for, my, for a working holiday and it was actually there in Vancouver, Canada that I uh, started to embrace my Indian culture and uh, most of my friends were Indian. Um, I, I spent a lot of time with family there and it was like discovering this whole new world. And it wasn't for another three, four years that I really started to get this deep desire to want to go to India. And um, it was on my way back uh, to Australia. I stopped in Hawaii and I had a bit of a spiritual experience. And as an animal lover and a tiger lover, I just had this, um, this pull that I needed to go to India in the next couple of years. And so I did plan for that trip. Um, but I don't think I planned it well enough. You know, I when I did step off the plane in Delhi, I was thinking, oh my God, what am I doing? <laughs> you know, I, I can't believe I'm here. I spent two months traveling around India and, you know, I, I did it in, in ways that were unsafe. Um, I ended up in situations where I was traveling alone at night because of train delays, um, ending up in local buses uh, that were full of mainly men, um, you know, encountering some harassment. But the one thing that I did learn was being that, you know, very confident and, you know, aggressive in situations where I needed to, you know, speaking back or, you know, um, making myself feel feel comfortable. And, you know, even if I wasn't confident, I really, really showed that. So that's what really kept me safe. And this underlying feeling that I was taken care of at a higher level, I always felt that there was someone that came to my rescue or, you know, that the right person turned up. So there were the, a lot of these synchronicities. And, you know, after those two months of travelling, you know, I had a really uh, tragic situation happen in Assam where I witnessed the aftermath of a rhino poaching. And, you know, that was my moment where I thought, wow, you know, is working in my industry and in telecommunications, is that really what I, want, what I want to do for the rest of my life? And from that moment, I realised that I really want to make a difference to communities and conservation and animals, and at the same time, help people travel safely to India. And since that trip, I've been back six times, um, and I spent six months actually in 2010. Um, after the GFC, I, I lost uh, I lost my job when I came back. Um, and then um, I decided, you know, I just got out of a destructive relationship and I just felt this calling again to go to India and, and India really, you know, I just fell in love with the country and um, it's been six times since I've been back. So I've really, awesome. it's, it's a love affair. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it, it seems to have that kind of grab. I just want to um, pause for a minute. I've noticed there's quite a few people having some tech issues that the videos have frozen, so I just want to um, make sure that because we're on a live Google Hangout that um, your, your computer will be using a lot of bandwidth, so make sure you don't have any other browsers or apps, or especially Facebook running, because that uses a lot of bandwidth. And you can also uh, refresh your browser, that should help. And um, Google Chrome works best with this product. And I've also, in the, there's a sticky note, there's a link to a YouTube video, so if all else fails, click on that, you can watch the live stream through that function and you can still use the chat box feature. So sorry about uh, jumping in there to let you that, but we do want everyone to be able to see uh, the video fine. So let's move on. I And I, I mentioned, um, you know, many people do feel called to go to India and I, I hear that all the time and the other thing I always hear from anyone who has been there is that India is a place they either love or they hate. I've never really heard anyone kind of give me something in between. So can either of you sort of speak to this idea and what might lead one person to go uh, one way or the other and how can we help anyone travelling to India to go more direction in the, in the direction of loving India? So does anyone want to jump out and well, speak to that? Yeah, I have a couple of thoughts on that. Um, um, if that's okay, Rina, if I'm sure you do too. Sure. Um, well, for one thing, you know, I have to say that um, India is not for everyone. And I, I'm always careful to walk this fine line between, you know, encouraging people who want to go. But I, I never try to promote India um, 
to you know to people who who are really not interested. If they're not interested, I say don't go. It's too difficult. It's too difficult. Um, but so that's one thing. So if if you feel drawn to go there, you're much more likely to love it. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. And then and then um, I think the other thing is attitude. And attitude is uh, attitude is important in every aspect of life. There's no question about it. You know what you bring to a situation is going to largely determine what you get what you get back from it. But for some reason, and I've written about this a lot. I feel this is especially true for travel in India. Like this is like you know to times pi or something. Um, India has India is very responsive, um, and so it kind of mirrors back to you. This is my experience. I've heard it from many people. Um, so whatever attitude you're bringing with you it's going to be mirrored back to you so I think attitude is key you really do have to go with the right attitude to India more more than anywhere else in my in my opinion mm -hmm. and Rena did you want to add anything into that yes totally um, look India is a challenging destination you have both extremes you know things can flow really well and there's times that you will be really challenged um, and I find that the one thing that I do tell my clients is to leave your Western expectations at home, you know, yeah. because, you know, things are not going to, you won't be getting your coffees on time, you know, things are not going to be running, you know, at the same speed and at the same way as they're running back at home. And the other thing is to take your watch off because, you know, there's this <laughs> thing called Indian Standard Time, <laughs> as you're aware of, Mary Ellen. In you know, so, stretchable time. <laughs> so, you know, it's just about, um, you know, just leaving those expectations at home, but also just being open. And I find mm. that the clients of mine that are really struggling with India or have come back with a not so great experience are really the ones that um, are not as open and prepared um, yeah. in yeah. embracing change. And mm. the other thing is you have to do, you have to surrender. You have to just surrender when you're there to whatever is going to unfold because although you can plan as much as you can and, and we do that for our clients, we plan as much as we can, but India sometimes has its own plans for you and you just, you know, you've got to go with the flow at times. Most of I the really, time. Yeah. <laughs> I really love how you say India um, has plans for you and it really does seem like India is that kind of place but I always also get this idea that well, life is like that not just travel to India and when you just be open and you surrender I just find amazing things happen and I, through my travel experiences I've learnt to do this so much better and our previous 18 months travelling with children certainly taught me this a lot more as well and I just think if you can find it within you to uh, tap into that open mindedness and that surrendering that, and that, Rena, you mentioned earlier you felt like you were supported and synchronicity and all these amazing things happen. When you look at the world through those eyes, um, then you're just going to love every experience that you do have. I just want to talk about, you, you mentioned, uh, Rena, that you felt your first trip you weren't really quite prepared mm -hmm. for India. And I think there are some countries you can just turn up in and be fine. You don't need to be prepared for. But I, I, I'm getting a sense that for India, if you want to have a great time, you, you do want to be prepared. So can we just talk a little bit about what are some things people do to prepare themselves to go to India, particularly for a woman, and, and why they, sh they should go there as well and not be so afraid? Like you, like you said, Caroline, I don't think India is that type of place like in Europe. You can turn up in Italy and, you know, you can book a, hol a, book a hotel right there and, and catch a cab and, and you're set. That definitely is not India. You know, I would recommend, you know, the great thing that is out now, which I didn't have so much in 2007, was the amazing blogs like Mary Ellen's blogs. Mm. Uh, going online and finding out some great information, TripAdvisor, have a look at some really good um, at hotel options. Um, if you're travelling solo, I'd also recommend looking at bed and breakfast options because mm -hmm. they really are a great opportunity to, you know, get immersed in a culture where you can try local foods. Um, you have a host there that will know some local secrets about the area that you're staying at. Um, so planning, preparation, 
you know, when I first went to India, I, I thought I was really prepared. I had this beautiful itinerary I created on, you know, in a spreadsheet. I had hotels booked. Um, when I turned up or when I called ahead, they had given my room away. Um, so there were moments where I just didn't have accommodation um, to go to. And, you know, again, those synchronicities, things fell into place and I, and, you know, I found my way out of that situation. But um, it's really important. To um, look at some great travel companies out there. If, if you think that solo travel isn't for you, there's some great group tour options. Um, or go with a with a travel company that does specialise in tours for solo females. It will cost you a little bit more, but you know, in the long run, it might be better to to pay a little bit extra to get a driver and a car. Um, you know, if, if you're doing like long distance travel rather than um, relying on trains and connections, although trains are great, but you know, if you're looking at getting connections to other places, um, you know, having a driver and a car is is a great option. Mm. You know, uh, Rena's talking about um, travel planning, and I agree with that. Um, I think um, doing a lot of research and doing your travel um, research planning um, is a really good idea. But there's there's other ways to prepare too, which I think has to do with researching the culture and the etiquette and what's appropriate. Um, before I went to India, I had the great fortune to stumble upon the Journey Woman site, and oh, right. um, yes. yeah, she's Journey Woman is amazing. She's been empowering women to travel. Uh, since the 90s, I and mean, she's she's the pioneer. And on her site, somebody suggested wearing Indian clothes in India. I think this was the game changer for me. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I made right. the decision. I just made the decision. I'm going to wear Indian clothes in India. And this was, you know, when was I doing my research? 2004, probably 2005. And from that day till this, I'm still wearing Indian clothes yeah. in India, um, and it really works for me. Um, you know, I, I'm a big believer of the when in Rome, do as the Romans do mm -hmm. style of travel and, and being very respectful of the culture. There's really um, to be respectful of a traditional culture. Um, and so wearing modest, you know, clothes suits the climate, it suits the culture. And just learning about etiquette, the fact that the genders do not relate the same way they do over here. There's no point in getting your shorts in a knot about that. That's just the way it is. Um, so you do have to be careful how you relate to the opposite gender. So there's there's getting prepared on a cultural level. And then there's one other type of getting prepared that I think is the most important. Unlike Rena, I'm just kind of a little embarrassed to admit, I had zero plans almost when I went to India. I, I had a, Over the six months I had a couple of things set up, but basically when I landed, you know, I, I, I was just flying by the seat of my pants. And I also agree, I also found that um, by luck or chance, I can't, I can't really take credit for it. Somehow, I did have the right attitude. I have the I had the attitude of, that you know I was on a quest, and I had this attitude that I was open to everything, and that everything that happened was what was meant to happen, and it was all to teach me and lead me somewhere, and I accepted it all. And I think when you, when you're in the right mindset, it's a very kind of specific mindset. These do these positive things do tend to happen. These synergistic things, and the whole time I was in India, and the whole time you know, and that's from 2005 till now, I have felt that there's sort of a, um, you know, I, I feel blessed. I do feel blessed, and I do feel I'm being protected and taken care of. I don't know how to explain it, mm. uh, but I think I, you know, going with the right attitude is also part of the preparation. Arena mentioned about leaving expectations behind, leaving your judgments behind, I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think when most people ask me um, what, you know, what are five things you'd recommend someone pack in their bag or, or take with them on travel, the number one thing I recommend is an open mind. Because yeah. I, I think if you don't have that, you, you, you're going to be going home in a, a couple of weeks' time. You just, it's too challenging because everything that you believe and everything you know will be, be challenged and unless you have an open mind to, to welcome that in, um, mm -hmm. you're going to create a lot of unnecessary heartache for yourself and, and then you'll be quitting on your dreams. So I, I just want to dive in, um, Mary, you, you mentioned about wearing Indian clothes and um, respecting the culture and, and I, I want to talk about that a little bit, a bit more and I, I want to sort of go into the aspect of the solo female traveller and, and some things that they can do to, I guess, ward off some of that unwanted attention because the, the sort of the picture that has is being painted a lot 
about Indian men is that they're sex addicts just waiting to pounce on foreign women. So I, I'd love for you to <laughs> you give us some insight. Um, is that reality or is that just men in general? <laughs> and uh, what men. are some things that women can do in India to um, protect themselves, to, to not uh, to ward off those advances, so to speak? Um, Rena, would you like to jump oh, out? Sorry. <laughs> um, well, firstly, you know, I have I have male family members that are Indian, so you know, I, I would not say that all um, Indian men are sex addicts. <laughs> um, there are some there's some beautiful men out there, beautiful Indian men. Um, one thing you do have to realise though is India is um, a very male dominated. Uh, country, you know, it, it, times are changing, but you know, there's experiences that I've had uh, over there where, as a female CEO, I haven't been taken as seriously because I'm a female, and you know, I've I've accepted that and I don't let it bother me. Um, but I think one of the things that actually does drive um, this is the media. You know, mm. what is showing on on their TVs is is Bollywood and Hollywood. You know, this as this aspect where a beautiful woman is walking down the street and this guy falls in love with her, you know, and declares his love ten minutes later and, you know, and that's not how life is, you know, so there's this mm -hmm. um, aspect of how the media portrays what is normal, you know, in in that kind of um, that relationship and also in Hollywood, you know, um, how the female is um, perceived as you know, you can sleep around. Like, not that that's the case, but you know, there's these things that are shown on TV, and and I know that does impact um, what Indian men think about foreign women as well. And it's not all, mm -hmm. it's not all the men. Um, but I have had situations where you know I had this lovely rickshaw driver in in Jaipur that um, took me around for a couple of days. And at the end of that, it was a, he was a lovely, sweet guy. He declared his love to me. Yeah. You know, and it was so innocent and it was so sweet that you know, <laughs> it's um, it's 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 also the media in 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 aspects. So, and it's mm. not the majority of men. Like I work with a um, a beautiful, my uh, one of my business partners. Um, he's a beautiful man. Sorry, my speaker just fell out. Um, and um, you know, there are men there that are just wonderful, very nurturing and totally respectful of women. So mm -hmm. it's not the case for that all men, <laughs> Indian men are sex addicts. <laughs> in, in, fa in fact, I just want to add to that, um, quite often in India you'll see things that you just won't see anywhere else. You'll see, you know, like, you know, growing men, middle-aged men, businessmen on a plane you know, and a baby starts crying, and it, it, I mean, in the West, this just wouldn't happen. But the the men will start, you know, cooing over the baby and taking care oh, yeah. of the baby, and um, it's it's a very family oriented culture. Um, mm. So you know, it's like in India, everything is true. You know, times you know ten, all extremes are there, and um, you know, some of the most spiritual and enlightened people of the past century, like Gandhi, um, Pandit Ravi Shankar, beautiful men come from India. And then unfortunately, it's a, it's a country of 1.2 billion people mm -hmm. um, yeah. and you know something like 600 million probably don't get enough to eat, they're not well educated. Um, and then there's a lot, a stream of migrant workers that um, you know pour into cities like Delhi and Mumbai and uh, yeah, and they're being exposed to these Bollywood images, and and you know, unfor it's unfortunate that you know they get the wrong idea. Um, mm -hmm. Most of, most of them are not dangerous, but they can be really annoying. They can stare at you and declare. And some of them are sweet. They yeah, they declare their love for you. Um, so it's not that it's not that these th problems don't exist. Um, it's not that you don't get unwanted attention and harassment. It's just that I think that when we talk about the media, um, we you know we have to talk about the fact that the the media in India and outside of India has really really blown um, the um, and certainly if you look I'm not a statistician, statistician but if you look statistically at any any statistics um, India just does not rank high statistics that have to do with rape. Um, tourist 
tourist attacks, nothing. It's very low statistically. Um, so there, you know, we have to we have to balance, you know, um, mis and and it, it both are true that you know you do get unwanted attention, but the way the media sensationalizes and overhypes the situation, I all out of proportion to the reality on the ground. I'm not. I've been spent. I've spent two years traveling in India, most of it by myself. I can't think of a time where I felt un particularly unsafe. I've had a couple of small incidents, but I've had the same things happen to me here in Toronto. So. Mm -hmm. Um, mm. what, what I always say, it's not where you travel, it's how you travel. You know, I think it's important to practice safe travel strategies. You know, everywhere, in India, um, in Toronto, in, in um, Thailand, in Spain, in all these different countries, I think it's very important that women practice safe travel strategies, no matter where they are. Can you um, offer any that you think are particularly relevant to India travel? Um, looking into the cultural aspects as well, I'm sure that it definitely ties in the way men and women relate to one another over there. Mm -hmm. Well, I think wearing modest clothes is absolutely number one. And again, you can rail against it, and, and some people think, you know, sometimes when, you know, I've had people comment, well, that's like blaming the victim. Um, you know, I don't even want to go down that road. Reality is reality. India is a traditional society for the most part. And in spite of what you see in Bollywood, and wearing modest clothes is just it's, it 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 helps protect you. You know, I believe this. And I, you know what else it does? It actually engenders respect because people see that you're interested in the culture. You're making an effort. Yeah. And my experience has been incredibly positive when I'm wearing my Indian clothes. That I I feel people um, regard me in a in a more respectful and. And so, for me, that is number one. Um, you know, there's a whole bunch of other things as well, and I'm sure Rena wants to jump in. Like, don't arrive at night unless you have somebody there to pick you up at the airport or the train station. Watch how you relate um, to other genders. I mean, the other gender. How many are there? Well, I guess there's a few now. Um, <laughs> but uh, um, Caitlin, you watch, watch. You know, watch how you relate. You, I mean, in in Canada, you can flirt with the waiter. In India, no, it's not a good no, idea. No. Rena, did you have anything else to add on to that? I, I totally agree um, with what Marilyn is saying. Like wearing traditional clothing or modest clothing really does help. Um, you know, there's there's no reason to draw attention to yourself. And I know that you may want to dress the way that you dress back home, but um, yeah, India is definitely a traditional um, society in in most aspects. Um, also, I would suggest uh, you know if you are in public areas. Uh, where there are men, um, don't give eye contact and don't smile. Smile at the women, but to smile um, at a man suggests that you're interested. So mm -hmm. I would suggest, you know, no unnecessary um, eye contact, and you know that that also works with street vendors as well. Once you, that eye contact means I'm interested in what you're selling. I'm interested mm -hmm. in you know what you have to offer. Um, the other thing I suggest is also looking at, uh, I mentioned before, but looking at female friendly um, accommodation. Um, you know, oh, there's so much, but um, yeah, it's really common sense, confidence, um, acting confident. Uh, that's yeah. one thing yeah. that I, as soon as yeah. I got off the plane, I was like in another state and, um, and I approached myself and others in a very confident manner. Like I knew where I was going. Even if I didn't, I, I walked like I had a mission, you know, and that really that really helped me. Mm. I think that I think that's huge. There's been studies done have, that have shown that uh, men tend to attack women who look vulnerable or afraid. So I think, and this is true, this is not just India specific, like anywhere women travel solo, female travelers. We talk about this all the time on We Go Solo. Um, walk walk with confidence, show confidence. And um, you'll start to feel it too. You know, it's fake until you make it, and mm. it, it, it's really, really important. Yeah. Um, and just touching on that, I did when I was in high school. We had someone come in uh, to our school to teach us self-defense lessons, and that was the very first thing they told us that confidence is, is going to help protect yourself in many, mm. many ways. Um, and just going back to the the whole of uh, you, you know men and violent crime against women and, and rape that is so widely publicised about India at the moment. Um, 
in, this can happen in our own backyard. And I'll just share a story of when I was a teenager, maybe, maybe about 16 or 17, I was walking home from school through a park and there was a group of young men there who were known in the area for being um, not someone you wanted to bring home to meet your parents anyway. So they went and they, they, as I walked past them, they did threaten to rape me. So this kind of stuff happens everywhere. It was an extremely scary moment in my life and I did just act with that confidence to continue walking past them. They were just trying to frighten me. Nothing happened. But it's just, you know, and I've been groped in Australia before in nightclubs and things. So just to be aware that this is not uh, specific to one country. I think we've spoken before about the statistics show that the, the worst is it's South Africa for these kind of things, but you don't hear about it. I've travelled through Africa for a couple of months backpacking. I never had one single issue. So we can... We can. We know this in our life. We experience it in our own backyards. We hear stories of people travelling who've been perfectly safe through these regions. But what some travellers are faced with, uh, particularly women, is having foreign um, departments, government departments, advising now um, to not travel to India. So, what would you say to a woman considering solo travel in India who is hearing these messages from the government? Because it's one thing to hear it from someone else, but when the government says this, it adds an extra element of fear. So what, what's your advice uh, in that situation? Well, I just want to correct you. It, um, I, I don't believe there's any travel advisory is telling people not to go travel to India. Um, my understanding is what they're saying is um, use caution and um, don't travel in certain areas. And this I absolutely agree with. One of my probably top, another one of my top tips for travel in India is actually to stay on the beaten path. Normally I'm an off the beaten path traveler, but in India I'll make, you know, I think this is an exception. I think it's a very good idea to stay um, within the well-traveled um, tourist circuit, the Golden Triangle, which is Delhi, Agra and Jaipur, Rajasthan, Kerala, Goa, Ladakh, um, which is a remote area, but it's considered to be a very, very woman-friendly area. It's a matriarchal society, as far as I know. Oh, great. Um, so, so I, yeah. So I think um, there's tribal societies in India that are matriarchal as well. So I would say um, I would agree with the advisories that say, you know, be cautious where you travel in India. I totally agree with that. It's been unfortunate that there, the couple of incidents that have happened in the last few years that have been highly publicized. Um, it's quite often they don't mention some of the facts behind these incidents and when you dig a little deeper you find out that um, in fact you know what the women were doing was what what I would consider you know not a safe travel strategy they were they were traveling one was in a very very remote tribal area in Madhya Pradesh and my Indian friends told me they wouldn't travel there mm. um, so I think you know um, pay attention to the advisories you know uh, to you know but use your and use your own judgment. It's like it's like going to a travel medical clinic. Before I went to India, I went to a travel medical clinic. I'm my goodness, they put the fear of God into me. I I I left for India with you know half a suitcase full of you know extra syringes and I was you know it was hilarious. I got there and I found out I felt like an idiot. You know it was perfectly civilized society with very sophisticated medical clinics. I didn't need all that stuff. So people will try to wind you up. You know. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Is there anything else you wanted to add to that, Rena? Yeah, look, um, I know for the uh, Smart Traveller website, they do have to exercise a high degree of caution, um, but they also have it for some, you know, other countries like parts of Turkey and, you know, like places that people do do travel to. Um, again, I think if you're if you're going to travel as a solo traveller to India, you you really have to do your research. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I do agree with sticking to some, you know, some the major tourist areas. If you are going off the beaten track, um, which is something that I love to do, is make sure you do that with a reputable company, um, mm -hmm. you know, and that you have um, uh, you're staying at at reputable places um, because there are some, you know, great cheap accommodation in India, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're safe. Um, so right. really do your research as to, you know, what parts of the cities that you're staying in. Um, you know, for example, in Delhi, I tend to stay in South Delhi. Yes. It's uh, very much a, uh, a very, it's, it's a safe um, area. I find that you see a lot of solo female travellers there. Um, mm -hmm. So, very yeah, cute. do your research about if you're going to these 
big cities, find out the safe parts of these cities to stay in. Um, mm -hmm. you, there will always be, you know, government um, warnings coming out. Um, they don't say do not travel. They do say do not tr travel to um, parts of uh, Jammu and Kashmir. Um, but mm -hmm. uh, as a whole, it's a high degree of uh, caution. They they say, yeah. Okay. Um, I just want to underline the, de the Delhi tip. My top tip for Delhi is to stay in South Delhi. Um, a lot of the budget hotels are, are, in, the, are in central or, or north Delhi, and they're just not nice areas. But there's lots of these little boutique places, little guest houses in South Delhi. That's actually my top tip for Delhi. There you go. Great yes. tip, girl. Thank you. Very, very useful um, for everyone listening. So, um, you know, we have spoken about the media being... Um, probably not giving it a, a fair enough picture and so personally I don't pay attention to the media so I haven't really heard much about these attacks against, against women so I don't have any fear or worry about that but my hesitation has always been you know uh, dealing with the crowds and, and the, the poverty um, so let's talk about that as, I, as I'm sure there's still some people who do worry about that a little bit so can you offer any tips about what, what people can expect and how they can manage that when they're traveling through India. Yeah, I, I, for me, I think, um, um, like I said, I, I've never really had big worries about the uh, safety as a woman. But but coming up against crowds and and um, heat, um, chaos, you know, um, travel delays. These are on the ground the things that you're really going to be worrying about more than than anything else. And um, I, I'm sure Rena's got some really good travel advice. Um, for you, but w what I will say is um, I've been able to stay in India for very long stretches of time this winter seven months because I have sanctuaries. I've got two sanctuaries um, so finding sanctuaries that you can go to. You just can't be out there in India for long stretches of time. You, you, you've got to, like I go to a yoga ashram near Rishikesh or you can hit the beach in Goa. Um, I stay with an Indian family in Delhi. That's my other sanctuary. Um, Kerala has beautiful beaches. Um, you know, there's there's wonderful little places you can stay out in the countryside in Rajasthan. I know a few that are gorgeous. You know, you've got to find these ra these these sanctuaries where you can just, you know, uh, get away from the crowds and the noise and just unwind. I think that's key if you want to stay in India more than a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. um, in in terms of of crowds, um, I don't really. For me, I. Because I tend to travel mostly to wildlife national parks and I'm really into nature, I guess that's my sanctuary is as what um, Mary Ellen calls it. Um, but, you know, finding parts of the city that aren't too crowded, like South Delhi, I don't find it very crowded at all when I when I stay there. Um, but obviously you will you will see crowds. You know, you will be um, you will notice when you're standing in lines that um, that the, the level of, um, um, you know, how people stand so close to you, your personal space will be invaded, you know, and so that's just, um, you know, part of part of the India experience, I would say. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, once you venture out of the cities, you know, there's villages and, um, you know, you don't see so much poverty uh, when you're in villages and when you're out in nature or you're up in the Himalayas, it's totally different. So, you know... Um, crowds are one aspect of India, but it isn't everything. It's not. It's not every part of India. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's true. And what about um, your your experiences with the the slums um, and the the poverty? Do you have any tips or, or what travellers can expect um, and what they can do here, particularly with things like beggars on the street and that as well? It, it, yeah, you look, know, sorry, go ahead. I've actually found over the past, you know, seven years of going, you know, back and forth to India, I don't really see too much, you know, for example, in Delhi, there aren't as many beggars as what there used to be. Um, but um, I don't personally support slum tourism, you know, and, and I do get requests about, you know, I'd like to do a slum tour and I, and I find um, quite um, insensitive to to the to the locals. Um, yeah, so like we don't try, we advise our clients not to give money um, to beggars, and um, that actually that money doesn't actually go to that to that child or to that. You know, it's a really it's an organised um, system. You know, it, it, 
it goes up to to a higher person. Um, so you know, and the government doesn't recognize rec recommend doing that as well. Uh, what I do do is I do bring um, you know little koala clips and little toys that I find that um, I love to see um, you know kids' eyes light up. And you know those koala clip clips are awesome. Um, I'm really, I get really sad about seeing stray dogs. So you know, I I do tend to sometimes buy some food for 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 dogs, or um, you know, if I do get approached, if someone's selling me something, I will probably buy it. Um, but if it's a beggar, I don't usually give money. That's my my tip is not, it's not going direct to them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, I, I, I agree with everything Rena said. I also don't personally support slum tourism. I don't, I, I've never, I don't go into the slums, so that, that's really um, not really an issue. Of course, you do see poverty. You do see um, um, beggars on the street. That's, that's for sure. But, um, you know, one thing I think people would probably be surprised, I mean, I've heard this many times over the years. I've been a travel blogger about India. They're worried about uh, you know, seeing this poverty and the effect it'll have on them, and I think they don't realize that it may have exactly the opposite effect than what they imagine. In fact, seeing it, uh, you know, up close and personal humanizes it. And what you find out is, these are people. These are the, these are their lives. Um, you know, there's some some extreme poverty in India, but for the most part, poor people live, um, you know, you know, lives of of dignity and respect. And um, even in this big slum in, in Mumbai that's so famous, a lot of people are writing about it now. There's a lot of industry there and there's a lot of pride. Um, and you know, you, you might be absolutely surprised to look this in the face and realize um, one other thing, which is you know, a lot of these people are, are happier and more content than you think. I don't want to make it kind mm -hmm. of a blanket, blanket statement, um, but um, they're humans, you know. They're they're living their lives just like we're living our lives. And to refrain from judgment and just see them as another human is actually a really beautiful, eye-opening thing. And that could transform your life in a, in a very, very positive way, and much more than you think. It, you, you 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 might think it's going to be some dark, negative, horrible experience, and you might find, as I did, in fact, it was exactly the opposite. Mm. Agree. Can I just add one thing to that? Is uh, one. One thing I do say to my clients is, you know, observe from a place of compassion, you know, mm. just uh, without judgment, without any, you know, the Western judgment that we have about, you know, what we think poverty looks like. Just right. observe, like when you're looking, you know, at um, whatever it is, just come from a place of compassion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I'm getting a sense because. India does seem to have the extremes, like it is, it's well known for its poverty, but it's so well known for its spirituality and it, it, you kind of think, well, how can these two things exist and how can they have these, you know, high spirituality but then there's these issues that we hear, which is media sensationalised about attacks on women, etc. But I'm starting, and I've wondered that myself, but just hearing you talk then, I'm kind of getting a picture now of, of how this works. I mean, you go there and and you're saying you get cracked open by this poverty, which teaches you how to be humble and compassionate and all these things, which then leads to spirituality. Um, and leads you to fall in love with India. Right, yes. yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I'm really getting a, a sense now of why India is one of those special destinations and how it can really change your life and your attitude and perception. In fact, I asked, I have an Indian uh, a guru, uh, uh, I go to a, uh, an ashram there, I've been going for nine years, and I asked the founder, what, what is so special about India? Why do so many seekers? India is the destination for seekers. It always has been um, since certainly the time of the Beatles and long before the Beatles. It's always been the destination for seekers. And I asked him why, and his answer was surprising. And he said it's because the extremes are there the extremes of spirituality, the extremes of materialism, the extremes, extremes of enlightenment, the extremes of brutality. It's because India has these extremes in, in, in measure that makes it the soul of the world. He called India the soul of the world. Oh, I love that. That's beautiful. Yes. And um, I, I feel that too. And, you know, I've had, I've had a client that's actually, you know, stayed in ashrams and then um, afterwards they've stayed in a homestay with us in Varanasi. 
And uh, one of the comments that I got back from her was her experience just being with the family that she was had changed her more than being in the ashram. So mm -hmm. what I what I got from that and what I feel from that is that you know the real heart and soul of India are the people. Mm. You know the Indian hospitality is out of this world and the connections and the people that you meet, people are really there to help you. You know, mm -hmm. if something is happening out in the open, um, look, if, if, if someone accidentally touches you or there's a situation, you know, all you need to do is, is speak up and yeah. you will have a ton of people coming to, to help you. You know, there's, a, there's a, a friend of mine, a family friend that was traveling on a train and um, she had been she had been groped and uh, and she spoke up about it and you know it was a slow moving train but <laughs> the uh, the perpetrator that had done that this because she spoke up um, a group of people threw this person off the train yes you wow. know so it's it's people power and people will be there to support you mm. That's I so absolutely to know. I absolutely agree with that. Social shaming works really well in India. Um, when people ask me, um, you know, why I love India, the first thing I say is the people. Um, people in India are warm and helpful. They have a saying in India, Atiti Devo Bhava, which means guest is God. And it's, you know, but a lot of the time, um, that is how you're treated. That you're a, you're you're a God visiting their home, and a lot of the time. You know they they do follow this philosophy. It is a deeply embedded philosophy philosophy within the culture, and I felt it many 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 times over there. And the other thing is, I agree with Rena that if something happens to you, you could be like in the market bargaining with somebody who's trying to get maximum rupees from you. You know, and then if you were like to trip and sprain your ankle, he would be the first guy to run and help you and pick you up and. Um, make sure you are okay. I, I travel all over India by myself as a solo woman and one of the main reasons I feel comfortable doing that is because I know it's a community oriented society. Mm. That the people mm. around me will help me if I'm in trouble. I feel that way more strongly about India than I do about my own country of Canada where the people are very decent yes. but I feel that more strongly about India and I really need to make this point. Yeah, I think it's a very uh, important point to make and uh, as you said, there's that sense of community there, which uh, just naturally makes you feel safer. And I and I don't think we have that as much in the Western world. Mm -hmm. So it's it is nice to hear that about India. And, and I I think your previous point about wearing Indian clothes is also a way to connect with the people of India. And I know I mean I haven't been to India, but I know I've uh, I've used that myself in other countries. Things like learning some of the language and connecting with them, even if you just say hello in their language, mm -hmm. that just opens up, even a smile, it just opens up conversation. And when and you, in, in India that's easy because it's namaste. We all know namaste, uh, right? We all know yeah. that. <laughs> My children namaste. know that. <laughs> yeah. And you know, when you put your hands like this, namaste. Yeah. And that's and it. it. That's it. There you go. You're on your way. <laughs> it just breaks down barriers straight away because it's such an honourable way of greeting one another. Even my, my three-year-old, she does yoga on the internet, so she knows Namaste and it's so cute when she says it. And it's just a way to break down barriers and get that connection because if you connect with the people of a country, I think that's when you have those memorable experiences that make you want to keep coming back. Um, I just I want to um, talk a little bit about organised tours. Now, for, for me, I, I do have that kind of sense of feeling a little uncomfortable going to India. Um, so, do you think for a solo traveller, it, it's a good idea to go over there on a tour? Now, Rena, you have a tour company, so maybe if we um, jump to you first, um, and if you can let us know your thoughts. Yeah, sure. Um, look, I think. It, it really depends on what your budget is. I think uh, what you need to work out is what are your reasons for travelling to India? You know, what is it that you really want to get out of it? What do you want to tell people when you come back about your trip? What do you want to talk about? So figure out whether you like... The, India has something for everyone. So are you into nature? Um, are you after a spiritual experience? Are you after... Um, you know, safaris or, you know, going up to the Himalayas or are you wanting to really immerse yourself in the culture? Um, if you're wanting, if, if you're wanting that extra level of protection um, and comfort and safety, 
I think uh, traveling with a travel company is a great thing to do. You know, some of the things that I personally do for my clients is we give them a mobile phone. Um, and whether you're traveling with a travel company or not, I think getting a mobile phone in India um, is a really good idea. Mm -hmm. um, the I've just lost my train of thought. Uh, the other thing that we do for our clients is we um, we use solo female traveller friendly accommodation. So again, whether you do that with a travel company or not, um, look look for those uh, accommodation places that are more uh, catered to solo female travellers. And bed and breakfasts are an awesome, awesome way uh, to travel around India. Um, and we also do brief the properties about um, if we have someone that's travelling solo. So there's an extra level of attention and care that we do. Um, we have um, my, my partner in India, uh, she's on the ground and we give our clients her mobile number. So she's available um, for our clients. So there's always that level of um, comfort knowing that if something happens or if I need um, to clarify something that I have someone to speak to. So, um, you know, and when I was travelling solo myself, I found that having a mobile phone, mm -hmm. um, when I w was travelling at night, I was actually communicating with a friend in Goa who was a travel agent that I'd met and he was calling ahead to the property to let them know about my delay. So I felt much safer knowing that I had someone there, you know, looking after me, um, you know, while I was travelling. Mm -hmm. um, so, That's great too. Yeah, so... And especially if you're going off the beaten track, um, I would suggest doing that with a travel company. Mm -hmm. um, if you're a little bit, you know, scared for your first time and you might want to, you know, travel with someone else, see if there's a, a you know, another friend of yours that wants to travel. Um, I've personally matched up um, two women uh, that have wanted to travel together just from knowing, from the inquiries that I've gotten. Um, but yeah, find find another uh, a travel buddy or uh, do a group tour. There's some really great group tours that do go off the beaten track as well. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, did you have anything to add to that, Marianne? No, I think Rena, you know, basically mm -hmm. covered it. She said everything that I would say. You know, as the uh, host of a, a female solo chat, one thing I always talk about is staying within your comfort zone. I mean, mm. nobody's, you know, we do have to overcome our fears to a certain degree, of course, or we just never leave the house. Um, but, um, but just be honest with yourself about what you can handle and what you can't handle. And yeah. um, I, I, one thing I recommend to a lot of people is to, you know, start with a group tour. And then, if you're going to stay longer in India, at least um, you've got that. You've got, you know. Um, so there's a big, there's a big learning curve to being in India, and to mm. to just land there and have to deal with the learning curve about being there, plus all the logistics, plus all the onslaught on your senses and everything else. It's really, really a lot to handle. I don't really recommend it. Um, mm. When I went there the first time, I stayed with a. A, a friend in Delhi. I still stay in the same house, the same Punjabi family. I'm like one of the family now after almost 10 years. And um, I didn't do a group tour, but you know, I had this this family that I was staying with. Um, so you should you need to have something. You need to have somebody, a friend there. You need to have a group tour. You need you need to do something. Yeah, I would, I would say. I think that's really important about um, you know we have to overcome our fears, but that idea of um, you know not not going so far out of your comfort comfort zone that you do fall apart, fall apart, which can happen. So to use a crux, something like a, a, a guided tour, tour company is a really great idea to feel protected and safe but still push your boundaries a little bit so that you right. can grow. Um, what we might do now, we're, we're sort of gone for an hour now, so uh, I know that some people have probably scheduled an hour out so some people might want to leave. So what I'm going to do now is just send people to the um, link where they can get their bonuses just in case anyone wants to leave now and then if you ladies are up for it we can still stay and answer some of these questions because there's mm -hmm. some great questions coming through yeah, sure. yeah, that's fine. Um, that's fine. so what's going to happen with your bonuses for everyone listening um, soon you'll get something fly out onto your screen that's going to direct you to a website you can just click on that it will take you to a page on our site and that is where you're going to find how you get access to your bonuses. So um, just be looking for that when that flies out onto your screen. And then if you need to um, 
head on out if you need to go. I know everyone's busy and got things happening, then by all means leave. You can catch this in the replay. We'll send an email to you with the replay of this so that you can come and watch it at any time and uh, get the answers to these questions. So let's jump on out then um, to some of these questions. So, um, so Megan asks, what are your must-see monuments or temples in India? <laughs> That is such a big question. Um, yeah, it's you know, it, India is huge. I've been traveling in India for years, and I feel like I've scratched the surface. Um, most people head to the Taj Mahal. Yeah, it is actually a must see. Um, but beyond that, boy, the, it's, it's even a hard question to answer. There's so much in India. That's the thing. Kajaraho, There's Hampi. There's um, oh, Kajaraho there's, is beautiful. There's, you know, there's temples everywhere in India. There's incredible historical sites. Rajasthan is a is a state filled with palaces. Um, it's very, it's really not an easy question to answer. It's it's an ancient civilization that's, um, you know, got just an unbelievable amount to see and do. Um, but my top piece of advice would be to pick an area. It's a huge country. It's the seventh largest on earth, and it's very rich. It's very dense. Um, and it's tiring to travel from one place to another. So don't try to get all over the country. Like pick an area, and uh, depending on how long you're there, um, and and concentrate on one or two areas. That's my advice. That's that's actually a really good point, Mary Ellen. Is um, you know if if you're spending a certain amount of time in India, and I recommend you know no no less than three weeks in India, and just pick a few places that you want to see because. There's so much to see and, you know, I've gone back, gosh, six times and, you know, I've only scratched the surface. Um, there are monuments and temples all over yeah, India. <laughs> so everywhere. it just depends on what parts uh, you, you're you really interested in seeing and, and you will definitely see um, monuments um, in those areas. Okay, great. Um, some good tips there. A question from Sabina. If I'm interested in staying in an ashram, do I have to contact a specific centre previously to program the stay or should I get there and ask for permission? Um, how does that work and how do I find these places? Um, I've got some information on my blog. If you go on breathedreamgo.com and just in the search bar put ashram, you'll, you'll find some good articles on, on uh, finding an ashram and what to expect. Um, Rishikesh is kind of a, a concentration. Of, there's ashrams all over India, but not all of them appeal to foreigners. And believe me, the ones that don't appeal to foreigners probably don't want to stay in unless you're really a, got a got a very very um, you know uh, serious spiritual practice. So uh, Rishikesh is a good great starting place because it, I, it's kind of like the Miami Beach of uh, ashrams. There's just tons and tons of ashrams there, and it does appeal to foreigners. And you do have to contact them ahead of time. Most of the time, there's no previous experience um, needed, but they do require that you're there, as a, you know, with sincerity, as a genuine uh, seeker, and that you follow the the basic rules. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, anything to add to that, Rena? Or uh, look, I'm not I'm not really big at staying <laughs> staying at okay. ashrams. I have helped clients um, organize that um, for them. But um, yeah, contacting them directly, and also Rishikesh is is definitely a place that has a concentration of ashrams, and uh, in the south as well in South India. Okay, great. Now Natasha asks, and Kin's interested in the answer as well. Can you recommend any spiritual places to visit in South India? In South India. Well, there's a lot of um, yoga ashrams, if that's what you mean. In Mysore, for instance. Um, but you know, everywhere in India is spiritual. South India is particularly spiritual. Uh, there's a lot of temples there. I'm not 100% sure what you mean. Um, it depends on it depends on what you're looking for. There's vipassana meditation. Um, there's um, yoga ashrams. It, it, we'd probably need a more specific question, I think. Okay. So if you wanted to, uh, Natasha, feel free to jump back out and um, maybe uh, clarify a little bit further what you you were looking for. And uh, so just in the meantime, Kin asks, is it risky to get to India with no itinerary and just let things take their course? I've had people tell me not to make too many plans for India, but at the same time I know that being safe requires some, fam uh, some planning and Kin would just like to know your thoughts. 
Mm. What I would what I would suggest is if you're pl if you want to kind of go with the flow, at least get your first couple of destinations and hotels sorted. Um, try and organise a driver um, and transfers from the airport. Uh, to your accommodation, um, as long as you, you know, and that's what I did in 2009, I found myself um, a place that I was going to stay for in a couple of months, uh, actually for about six months, so uh, I actually got to India, I stayed with some family friends and then I, and then I went looking for some accommodation but I found, I had a place to stay first, so I think it's important to get yourself a base first and then if you want to organise travel, that's definitely possible mm -hmm. from there. Yep. Agree. Um, and uh, Natasha has just clarified she means temples and ashrams in South India. Okay, there's temples everywhere, and I mean everywhere. It's you know, it's like Seven um, Elevens here in here in uh, Canada. <laughs> um, so no worries about temples. Um, and then ashrams. Um, yeah, ashrams. It's probably better unless, as I said, you're got a very serious spiritual practice. It's probably better to um, stick to ashrams that cater to foreigners. Um, there's a very big, famous one in South India, which is, of course, the Shivananda Ashram near um, in Nair Dam, which is near Trivandrum. That's a uh, place a lot of foreigners go to. Um, so it just will take to you know some research to find out um, about ashrams. There's a lot of Goa in Goa. There's a lot of sort of on the beach ashrams. I don't know how serious they are in terms of ashrams, but there's a lot of yoga retreats now in India uh, that cater to foreigners, especially in Goa and some in Kerala. So you could do some research on those. Mm -hmm. I, I would also I suggest, also suggest um, Karnataka. The state of Karnataka has some amazing um, Jain um, monuments and, and temples in a place called Belur. And there's one in particular that's called, um, it's really hard for me to pronounce, but um, Shravana Belagola. And it's this amazing um, statue built out of a single piece of stone. Apparently it's the largest um, statue out of one single piece of stone. And that's pretty, pretty amazing to see. So, um, yeah, Karnataka as well as Kerala, but Karnataka has some pretty amazing uh, monuments and temples there too. Okay, great. Um, we might move on to Shirley has asked, uh, what additional precautions do you need to take um, regarding train travel? Book well in advance. The train yeah. absolutely books out. I mean, we're talking 1.2 billion people. They use the train. Book well in advance. That's my, my top tip. Um, I love taking the train in India. I spend a lot of time on the trains. I don't really have any big worries about it. Um, some people say, uh, you know, it's really important to watch your luggage. So what I do is I have a cable lock. I just lock my luggage to my to my seat or my berth or whatever, and I don't really worry about it. Um, I have never had a negative incident on a train. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I yeah, just book well in advance. Okay. I would also suggest the same thing, having having a cable lock, um, and if you can get get an upper berth um, sleeper, so that you know you're not on the ground. Um, that's that's always a safer place to to sleep. Um, and one thing that I do also do is I make myself known to uh, the train conductor on mm -hmm. on there. I oh, let him too. know. The thing is for me that I find that. Um, I, I can't, all the signs are in Hindi, so I don't really know what, what my next stop is. So I always ask the train conductor, can you please let me know when you when I get to my stop? And um, they That's seem to keep an eye out for you because you're travelling on your own. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what a great tip. That's awesome. Um, mm -hmm. We'll move on to Sidoni asks, uh, she wants to know where to stay and live like an Indian. Any? Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> um, you, could stay, you could stay with experience. my friends. <laughs> if you want to experience, like, um, you know, staying with a local family, I think that's great. Like doing a bed and breakfast homestay experience mm -hmm. would be really good. And homestay. they're actually really good for um, long term um, stays. So the one that I've stayed in in, in Delhi was uh, by a, a, a single female and um, when our 
you know, the best of friends. Um, and I found it really safe and just comforting staying with another woman. And how I've, can you I've, go? I've stayed, in, I've stayed in the same place. We're we're also the yeah. best of friends. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a great place to stay. And how can someone go about booking or connecting with a homestay? Shirley's asked that question, so I think we'll answer that one now while we're talking about it, about it. Well, Look, you know, I think it's you can, sorry. sorry, you can use um, services like FlipKey or Airbnb. You know, or TripAdvisor has guest houses and homestays on it. Sorry, go ahead. I totally agree. Um, Airbnb is, is a good option. I would also just make sure um, the, the homestays and the bed and breakfast that we use in our company, they're registered with the government, government of India. Um, so we know that there's a certain level of standard um, that, that they're using. Um, you know, the rooms have to be a certain size, the bathrooms have to be a certain way. So, you know, do your research online or you can book with, with, with a travel company. But yeah, really, there are, so, there are so many homestays in India. It's just fine making sure that you're staying in a good one that's in a good part of the city. Yeah. Okay, uh, great. Um, Edie's asked a really great question when we were talking about, um, you know, dealing with the poverty and beggars. And, um, can you buy them a meal if they ask for money? I don't usually buy meals for people, but I'll tell you something. When I, if I'm in a nice restaurant and there's like leftovers, I'll pack it up and I'll give it to someone. Or sometimes if I'm just eating, this happens all the time um, near near where I stay. I'll be I'll be eating like a bag of peanuts or something, and I'll be walking by the beggars who are on the street corners. And it, and if the kids look like they want the peanuts, I just hand them the peanuts. Things like things like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Um, so, uh, do you want it? Yeah. I oh, look similar, similar for me, and it really just go with what your gut um, says or how mm. you feel. You know, um, it's really a personal, personal thing. Yeah, I totally agree. Gut will always tell you the right thing to do. Um, we're going to have a question from a male. Harold um, has a couple, and Harold's really interested about uh, Vanasi and the Ganges River. So, can a first-time traveller to India safely visit? Uh, Vanasi and the Ganges River and have you bathed in the Ganges and any specific suggestions for visiting? Um, I would say um, for me it's Rishikesh. I, I don't have any problem going into the Ganges bathing in Rishikesh because this is the place where the river comes out of the mountains and it's at the beginning of its journey through towns and things like that and it's actually very clean. It's cold, it's glacial, but it's very very clean. In um, in Rishikesh, I, I personally would not get into the river in Varanasi. Mm -hmm. uh, I I agree with Mary Ellen. I've actually bathed in the Ganges in Haridwar, which is um, it's actually the the first city just before Rishikesh. So it's the first city um, that the Ganges runs through, and it's it's called the gateway to the gods. Um, and I found it a really amazing experience uh, doing that myself. Totally agree. I would not do that in Varanasi, um, but there's some amazing things that you can do in Varanasi on the Ganges. You can you can do a morning boat ride and really get to see, um, you know, what the locals do, the religious practices. It's quite amazing, and then the evening arti as well. Um, so that's another really beautiful experience um, to do. And then walking down some of the back streets of of, of Varanasi. Um, and we do use a really good bed and breakfast in in Varanasi. So another good option is is, is staying at a guest house or, or a homestay in Varanasi. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, great. So I hope that helps with your travel. Harold also wanted to know when we were talking about booking train travel well in advance. How in advance do you recommend? Well, there, there's um, I can't remember whether it's two months or three months, and they actually recently changed it. Do you know, Rena? They, they actually only release tickets either two months or three months before, so you can't book pre before that. So whatever, if it's two months, try to you know count back two months um, for for you know when they actually release the tickets. Honestly, in some cases, as soon as as soon as you can, as soon as you know for the for the for the well-traveled routes. Um, and otherwise, I would say um, a month is probably enough. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I agree as well. Um, Marsha has asked, "Do you take malaria 
prevention when you are staying only in major tourist areas? I don't. Rena, do you take? I don't, but I always do recommend to my clients that um, you need to feel comfortable with what vaccinations and what what precautions you take. So I would recommend visiting your doctor or health practitioner or naturopath or whoever it is that you see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and That's it, good, that, advice. That good advice. Being, com being comfortable as well, um, yeah. again, and, taking it back to that. And look, if you're staying, you know, like in South India or places where it's really hot, there will be mosquitoes. Um, so you do need to, um, to think about yeah. what what level of precaution you're going to take for, for malaria? Mm -hmm. It's not just malaria. In fact, um, my understanding is that India is not one of the hot spots for malaria compared to a place like Africa where, it, where it's, you're more at risk. But there's also den dengue fever um, mm -hmm. is another mosquito-borne um, illness and there's no protection against that. Yeah. So mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in India, I think it's just wise to not get bit by mosquitoes. <laughs> and, and just just don't um, use spray long sleeves just try not to get bit I really I really do go out of my way to try not to get bit honestly Mos mosquito netting you can even carry yes. portable mosquito netting just try honestly try not to get bit yeah eat, eat a lot of Vegemite <laughs> apparently <laughs> there are also some really great essential oils that you can use for um, for mosquito prevention, if you want to go down the natural route, and um, I can send you the link to that, um, Kaz, if you're, if, if um, yeah, yeah, sure, and I'll I'll, like pop, I'll pop it on that resource page that um, we sent everyone to before, so they can right. get that there. That'd be great. I, Thank I, you. I, I used one that's very popular in, in India that you that I buy there called Odomos. I'm sure you know Odomos. I use the I use Odomos, and it seems reasonably, I don't know, it seems reasonably non-toxic to me and it seems to work. Yeah. Okay. Uh, great. Um, so I have Sabina, should I take special precautions with food? I've heard that it is usual for tourists to get sick with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, look, I've had my, my first trip to India, um, I did get sick and uh, the reason was is I stopped at, um, I didn't stop at uh, uh, the the most uh, you know cleanliest place to eat, and uh, that really impacted the rest of my travel. I was sick for a few for a few weeks. So what I would suggest is making sure you're drinking bottled water. Um, eat only cooked food. So you know stay away from from salads. Even if there's chili on the side, I would probably not recommend that. Um, you know. Uh, but th those would be my main things: is to make sure that food you eat is cooked, um, fruit, uh, ones that you can peel, so bananas, oranges, um, things like that. Things that are washed in water, that's what you have to be concerned with. So if it's mm -hmm. cooked, then it then it's fine. Mm -hmm. And water, you know, what I've heard is it's it's usually water, um, and water can kind of sneak up on you. It could be water from the tap. A lot of people brush their teeth with bottled mm -hmm. water. It could be ice cubes. Water has a sneaky way to, to um, infiltrate your life. Um, it, opening your mouth in the shower. I mean, shut your mouth when you're in the shower, seriously. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's water more than food is what I've heard that you really, really have to be careful of. Although I do agree with what Rena's saying. Um, but be very, very careful about water. I, I've never been really sick in India. I haven't had that experience. I've gotten deli belly and um, usually what I do is I drink, you know those oral rehydration? rehydration mm. salts packets, you know, the ORS mm. they're called. Um, I always travel with those and mm. when I get a deli, touch of Deli Belly, I, I, I mix those with water and I drink a lot of those and usually by the next day I'm fine. I haven't really had, I've been lucky I think. Yeah, yeah, and I, I know coconut water is full of lots of natural electrolytes as well, so. Exactly. Um, Keep, yeah, just hyd hydrate, hydrate. If you yep. get sick you have to hydrate, that's the key thing, it's really important. Um, and Edie's just mentioned that um, she had dengue fever two times and highly recommends using a spray with DEET. And I just wanted to mention that because when we took the girls to Thailand um, and I spoke to my doctor and I, I said, I don't want to put DEET on them because, you know, obviously there's a lot of bad things in there. And he said, look, you're only going to be using it once or twice. The alternative is they get really sick. 
Yeah. And that's going to affect them more than what putting the DEET on their skin would for, mm -hmm. you know, a short length of time. Um, mm -hmm. And that really made a lot of sense to me. And um, I obviously look for alternative methods always, but I guess as Edie's saying, in situations if you just really want to ensure you're not going to get dengue fever, then sometimes you might just want to put some DEET on. Mm -hmm. Um, and we'll jump to uh, Ash. Ash also asked about the food, so we've covered that. But another question was, has anyone travelled to the Sangam in Alabad, in no. the confluence of three three rivers? I've never been. No. No? <laughs> no. Sorry, Ash, we can't we can't help you out with that one. I have, I have been to the Kumbh Mela. If she's talking about the Kumbh Mela, which is the big spiritual uh, gathering that happens. Um, it happens in different places. The big one happens in Alabad. But I have been to the one in Hardwar, and I've, I had quite an amazing experience there, and I have written about it, if that's what you mean. But I haven't been to the Sangam. Okay. Um, another question coming back to train travel. Shirley wants to know, does the Indian train system accept payment online with US credit cards, which seems to be a problem for her in Europe? Just American Express. Okay. There you go. That's, that's strange, because in Australia, <laughs> most places don't take American Express. Go Look, figure. Quick question in to India, Mary Ellen. India. <laughs> quick question to Mary Ellen. Um, do you book your trains online? Because obviously, I have a my local team in India that does it for me. Um, so how how easy is it for you to book book it online? Yeah, I sort of remember setting setting it up originally was a nightmare because as a foreigner, you have to give them scanned passports and everything. I so, I don't know if it's still like that, but when I first set up my account on on Indian Railways, IRCTC, it was a bit of a nightmare to be honest, but once I got it set up, um, then I found it quite quite easy to use, and I often use um, Make My Trip, or I've also tried Clear Trip, there's, there's you know, they have different um, services, online services that can help you in India, Make My Trip is the big one, um, so I have an account with them, and um, but sometimes as a foreigner getting these things set up, like getting a SIM card, you do have to jump through a few more hoops than you would in other countries. You have to bring, you know, copies of your passport, copies of your visa, um, those little extra passport pictures. You should always carry a bunch of those things with you to set up these things because they're always required. I, I also took my passport and um, had it scanned, including the page with my visa, and I have a scans of my passport, and I've often had to email those to different mm -hmm. places. So there's sort of extra things you need to do in, in India because of the bureaucracy. Um, mm -hmm. So just being prepared for that. Um, and or you know or you know just go through a travel agent. Find a good mm -hmm. find somebody good who can do all your bookings for you. There's that option as well. Yeah, great idea. You know, um, so sometimes I've actually found that um, you know the benefits of, of being a travel agent like not being able to get, you know, if, if I've needed to get tickets for a client that's been kind of, you know, the last couple of weeks, there are certain things that we can do to kind of push that. So there are benefits to going with a travel company for things like, um, you know, booking trains and and, um, and drivers and things, yeah. Mm -hmm. Definitely I do, bringing back I, that comfort level again too. Sorry, I go just ahead, want Mary. I just want to mention one more thing about the trains. I don't really recommend this, but just so that you know, as a backup, it's available. There is a foreign quota system. Um, so in a couple of train stations in India, in Delhi for sure, I believe also in Mumbai, there's a there's an office you can go to. It's it's kind of like um, a scene from a Kafka play. It's just you know, it's not not fun. It's like this old office with this massive lineup of people and the air is not moving and it's just pretty awful but you but you know if you're desperate you can go there and you can line up go first thing in the morning that is my top tip there go first thing in the morning find out when it opens and you go to this foreign foreign booking office at New Delhi uh, it's NDLS New Delhi train station and you can get the foreign quota you can sometimes get seats on a train under the foreign quota if you're really desperate I, but it's not my I wouldn't recommend it unless I was desperate Okay, that's a that's a useful tip for people to know if they're in that situation. Um, just coming back to the to the water, um, Natasha asked about brushing teeth with tap water. Now I know that just from my experiences, don't don't do it. Um, don't do it. You you could swallow that water. It's not not worth the risk. I've done it before in Asia, and uh, yeah, I just wouldn't recommend it. I did get sick. I don't know if it was from brushing my teeth with the water or not, but I would just not um, uh, risk it. Thank, thanks for joining us, Cliff. Uh, just Cliff going but 
Ken asked, which is quite interesting, I'm guessing the answer is no, but is it unsafe to shave with India's tap water? No um, response? <laughs> I, don't, I don't think so. I don't think the water would go in your mouth. So No, it's, it's yeah, just you're, yeah. not, you're not worried about it on your skin or something. You're worried about yeah. ingesting it. It's the, di it's the digestive yeah. issue. It's not the, it's not, you know, yeah. I guess I guess maybe the, the when you're shaving though, I'm guessing it would open up the it, pores. That's not if you cut or anything like that. Yeah, that's no? not the problem. The problem is the digestive. Okay, cool. Um, Natasha asks, can you talk about travelling by bus? No. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do it. Don't. <laughs> uh, look, I from my experiences, don't. I would go with trains. And uh, and via and cars, car and exactly. driver, Those and and planes. Plane travel in India is relatively cheap, and the domestic um, air travel safety record in India is phenomenally high. It's one of the best in the world, actually. They've got some excellent airlines in India, and the, and these these little short hop flights are not very expensive. Okay, I agree. Um, India is quite like these. You know, a lot of the cities are very accessible by by tra um, planes. Okay, and is that is that the bus reason because of um, safe, excuse me, safety concerns in regards to accidents, or is it um, personal safety and being yes, um, both, <laughs> both, okay. both. It's not comfortable. There's lots of accidents. Um, no, I okay. okay. My experience was uh, really hanging on for my life with. Half a bum cheek on the seat. Um, you got half a bum cheek. Oh, yeah. you're lucky. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it sounds a lot like travel in Africa. Some of your best stories comes from the public transport. <laughs> the, chicken, the chicken bus. What do they call it? The chicken bus. Oh yeah, they all sorts of things over there. But yeah, one of them's the chicken bus. You know, the um, truth is that India's roads are very dangerous. They have a lot of accidents. I'm sorry to say that. I'm not happy about it, but there is a lot of accidents on the roads in India. And when you go there, you can easily see why immediately. Mm. Yeah, something that's um, of concern. So there's some great tips. Um, thank you. Uh, Sierra asks, I have a SteriPen for my camping backpacking. Does it work for overseas travel? Too, for yeah. killing all the bacteria. I, I carry yeah. with the travel size Steri pen. I like to have it as a backup. I have used it in India. Okay, great. Um, and I, we have one last question here at the moment from Kin. What is the length of time permissible for um, Canadian visas? I bought a ticket already six weeks. I hope that's not an issue. I'm not sure I understand the question. How long does it take to get a visa in Canada for India? Is that the question? Um, Sounds like more the time frame. Yeah, maybe the time frame. Ken, if you're still on, if you could just maybe clarify uh, that. Are you asking the length of time that you get a visa for or how long it takes uh, in application process? Um, I will mention, though, sorry. Um, that, there, time is, time. there is the um, e-tourist e visa, which um, has recently started for... Um, many countries including Canada and Australia and if you're traveling within 30 days then it's a really good um, and quick option um, for a visa. Uh, you only really need uh, 48 hours. I would recommend at least a couple of weeks before you travel though to apply um, but it's all instant, it's online. Uh, for Australians you do need to, you can go with that option or if you're staying longer you can apply for a tourist visa um, and you can get up to six months. Mm -hmm. It is important though if you are travelling like to other countries like Sri Lanka or Bhutan and then coming back into India, make sure you get a, a visa with multiple entries, not single entries, otherwise you won't be able to get back in the country. Okay. The, si the, situation, is, the situation is pretty much identical to that for Canada. Um, Although these things are really changing. Um, India is trying to make their visa process easier and smoother. Um, they're talking about um, giving Canadians the option of actually having a 10-year tourist visa, believe it or not. Um, so uh, it's, best, it's best to get um, uh, recent information, to go online and get, get the most mm. recent information. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Ken just has clarified, um, can uh, the visa for a six-week stay in India, so is that possible? 
you then you can't use the e to e, 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 e tourist visa because it's only for 30 days. If right. you want to stay for six weeks, you have to go through the regular process and get the six-month tourist visa. Okay. Okay. Um, we have uh, Shirley just wants to know: Are there any luggage restrictions on air travel? I guess um, from a domestic standpoint. Domestic, uh, usually it's like with Air India, it's usually 15 kgs for the cheaper tickets. Um, if you wanted to go for 23 uh, kilograms, I would suggest paying a little bit extra so that you have more um, more baggage requirements. Um, I'm not sure about the other airlines, but usually domestically, the, the baggage is a, is less, usually about 5 to 10 kgs less than the international um, uh, mm -hmm. baggage. But I would suggest just checking with, with the airline websites. Mm -hmm. Great. And we've got one last question um, from Natasha. What is the best time of year to travel in South India? Hmm. Well, um, what do you think, Rina? <laughs> it depends on the type of travel you want to do. You know, monsoon is actually a great time for um, some national parks in India because it's more of an adventure, you know, and everything's really green. Um, if you're wanting to, to do a wellness ret uh, retreat and uh, doing like a punch karma um, process, maybe the off-season would actually be a little bit cheaper and it might be a better time. Um, I, would, I would suggest, though, uh, if you're not wanting to travel when it's really, really hot, um, any time from October through through to you know late February, March is the less hot time. <laughs> mm -hmm. The less hot of hot. Yes. <laughs> um, okay. So if we uh, don't have anything else to add, I think we might. Um wrap that up there. I might just, if it's not still out there, I might just put out um, that web page again that you can go to to grab your um, your free bonuses for joining us on the webinar. So thank you. Um, it's been great. It's been awesome to have you both here sharing your tips about India and helping solo travellers, particularly in women, feel safe and comfortable. I know I feel much better now and I think India seems like a destination I actually would love to explore more and I definitely feel a lot more comfortable with having you on here and I think that was the purpose of this was to um, you know, share with people who have that calling that India is a place to visit and you can go there and have a wonderful time and not feel so threatened or afraid. So thank mm -hmm. you so much ladies for joining us. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. to you. Oh. We have one more. We have one more question from Sierra. Do you think we can uh, throw it in there? Sure. Uh, I want to buy most or all of my clothes for India. When in India, how inexpensive is it to get the clothes yes. custom made, or should I just buy them pre-made? No, I. This is actually something I always recommend. You know, there's a few things you want to bring: comfortable shoes, underwear. I don't know. I don't like the bras in India, but um, in terms of getting your your Indian outfits. Yeah, just head straight to Fab India. There's a store called Fab India, and they're all over the place. There's a couple of big ones in Delhi, and um, just go straight there, and, and you can get some things off the rack. You can get th some things um, made for you later, but just when you get off the plane, just you know, um, go straight to Fab India. That's what I recommend. Awesome. I Great. agree. Fab India is one of my favorite places, and Anoki in India as well. Two awesome shops. Great. Just before we sign off, can you just let everyone know, starting with you, Rena, where can people connect with you? I'm on Twitter uh, at Mantra Wild. Uh, I'm also on Facebook, uh, Mantra Wild as well. And uh, I'm also on Instagram at Mantra Wild, M A N T R A W I L D. If uh, you want some more tips or you know you have any further questions, feel free to email me which is info at mantrawild.com.au. Great, thank you. And Mary Ellen? Um, yes, I'm, I'm Breathe, Dream, Go everywhere on the web. Uh, breathe with an E at the end, Breathe, Dream, Go. And so I have a travel blog. I've got like literally over 400 articles 
tips, stories, advice, things like that on breathedreamgo.com. So please visit. And um, and you can find me literally anywhere on the on the internet as Breathe Dream Go on Twitter, Facebook, Pinterest, Instagram, you name it. And um, yeah, feel free to get a hold of me. You will see the contact um, tab on my blog, breathedreamgo.com. Awesome. And I'm whytravelblog.com and all the uh, relevant social hash. Um, my name on social media is at whytravelblog. Um, and we'll be sending you an email with links to this replay and I will also put a link to that resource page for you as well. So thank you so much for joining us. Remember the hashtag WeGoSoloIndia. Um, use that. We'll be checking it and uh, we can chat more about travel in India through there with you. So thank you Namaste. so much. Namaste. Namaste. Thank you so much. Namaste. 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 Namaste to all our attendees. <laughs>